And this ATF agent goes into my manager's office and says, I need to see that form. So my manager doesn't know any better and he hands it over. Brendan is on the phone with the lawyer and the lawyer says, tell him to go bleep himself. And so Brendan comes out and says, yeah, we're not going to give you that information. I'm sorry. What? He hits the moon. No one has ever denied me that form. That's ATF property. Those forms are ATF property. And we're like, no, they're actually not. So let's let's get into the specifics of H4885. If you're not a gun owner yet, it's going to put more hoops to jump through in order to exercise your right to keep and bear arms. They have violated 18 to 20 year olds rights by saying you can only buy a certain type of weapon now. You can't buy a handgun and you can't buy a semi-automatic rifle or shotgun. You can only buy bolt action, lever action, pump action, slide action, single shot, that type of weapon. You're an adult by every aspect of the law, except when it comes to firearms, you're still an adult with an asterisk. There are a lot of liberal gun owners out there. I've had this conversation with many of them that on a list of one to 10, what is the most important thing on election day? The second amendment is number nine through 11 for the liberal gun owner. There's some people like myself where it's number one because I recognize once the second amendment is gone, it's only a matter of time before the rest of the rights are gone. I make that point and they instantly acquiesce and say, yeah, you're right. We don't hold our politicians accountable at the ballot box because if we vote for the right winger and we get all the other stuff we don't like. I would urge those who might be not a conservative but still believe in their right to keep and bear arms to hold their politicians accountable on election day. There are now firearm dealer inspections, so now officials can just walk into Cape Gun Works. Technically, they could once a year anyway, and we're supposed to. It's actually kind of funny because years ago when we first opened, I would have a firearms official for the town come in and say, what am I supposed to be doing? They had no idea what they're supposed to inspect. And after five or 10 minutes, they'd be like, all right, looks like you're doing everything right. Fist bump, see you next year. How are we doing, everybody? Welcome back to the Sons of Liberty podcast. My name is Sam. This is Hunter. And today we are back with our first guest that we had on the podcast back in episode two in November, Toby Leary with Cape Gunworks. Welcome back, Toby. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm glad to be back and glad to hear that uh, we've come full circle. It's been <laughs> yeah. about a year, yeah. right? So uh, yeah. here we are. Here we are. It's, it's, a, it's been a good time. It's been a wild ride for our, for our listeners. Um, Today, we want to do a follow-up, so to speak. We had a lot of, we've had a lot, uh, a large growth in our audience in the past month since the, since Moore Healy signed H4885 into law, which is basically the progression. uh, It's what HD 4420 used to be. And the podcast, when we had you on last time, that's what we talked about, HD 4420, uh, presented by Michael Day. And that has essentially morphed into 4885. And so I figured we'd do a follow-up because I'm worried that like a lot of people might see that old podcast and think, oh my gosh, that's ju- that's what Moore Healy just signed into law, which is not true. It's it's a different, it's different. Um, I, I would say, I don't, do you think it's worse than 4420 or have they taken some things out? I would say it's comparable, but there's certain aspects of it that are better for us and certain aspects of it that are a lot worse. Yeah. So um, there's no way of, you know, grading it on a scale of one to 10. It's it's a zero. Like both bills were a zero for yeah. freedom. Yeah. Like there there's nothing about it that's going to reduce crime, that's going to make our streets safer, that's going to lock violent criminals away. None of that is in this bill. It's all literally a threat of government violence on peaceful people. Yeah. Well, I mean, if, if 4420 took away 100 rights, would you say 4885 maybe only took away 98 or even more? Both bills dealt with every aspect of gun ownership in Massachusetts. Really? So So it was just comprehensive. Yeah, it's a comprehensive omnibus bill. The final bill was 116 pages long. That's crazy. So you can't just parse out one thing, and that's what the media is doing. There's a lot of people in response to my vocal opposition to this bill that are saying well, you can still sell guns, and this is really about keeping ghost guns out of the hands of violent criminals. And it's like, uh, no, (laughs) that is not what this bill is all about. Ghost guns, or the so-called ghost guns, are one sliver or slice of this overall 
egregious unconstitutional law. And I wish that they would just do a bill about ghost guns so that it's very clear for every single Massachusetts citizen to understand what, if they passed it, what would actually be happening. But since they put it in an omnibus, you, it gets right. lost in translation. You don't know what's happening. It's hard for, or let's say a representative who disagrees with the bill, it's hard for them to, to accurately, um, I mean, let's say, you know, they're more moderate and there are parts they agree with, parts they don't agree with. How, how are they supposed to vote? I mean, that's a general problem with omnibus bills is right. they, they, they pack well, so many different things the, into it. But The long and short of it is if you want to have a ghost gun bill, do that as a separate piece yeah. of legislation. Still unconstitutional. Yeah, of course. Of still course. violating your oath of office yes. by doing it. You're still committing malfeasance and not being a um, confidential defender of the rights of the people. And I would argue that this country was founded on ghost guns. So... Uh, you know, the, <laughs> that's a line right there. There you go. King George III sent his redcoats on Concord and Lexington to seize the guns, the powder, the shot, the primers, the, you know, all the caps and the balls and everything. And the, but every single one of those guns was unserialized. They didn't know what the barrel length was, what the caliber was, you know, who made it. All they knew is they had guns, right? And that's what our country was founded on. And for 240 years, people have had the right to manufacture and own and possess guns that they make out of their own enjoyment for their own freedom hobby reason. And now we're trying to control a criminal element behavior by controlling the masses. That doesn't work in any other segment of society. It doesn't work for any other aspect of society that's like you know you're trying to fix drunk driving by making it harder for sober people to buy cars mm. like not gonna work right yet we lose our intellectual ability to reason and logic when it involves firearms and you're not already a pro second amendment guy we start to say oh yeah well if we can just keep the guns out of the hands of bad people or if it'll just save one life or you know, and everybody wants that. There's even pro 2A people are like, yeah, I don't want bad guys with guns. The problem is how you're dealing with that. Right. You don't do that by restricting my rights. And that's their approach. And that's their only approach. They don't have any nuance to saying, oh, maybe if we just lock violent felons up for long periods of time to the maximum allowed under law, they won't reoffend. Instead, they're like, no, you can't have a gun that you're constitutionally able to own. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's our way of fixing the problem. Yeah, it's almost like they come up with the, all these different arguments and they put out a crazy bill like this. So you're almost like, where do I even start? Because the, it's like the shock factor of I can't believe that they're doing this. And like in the you know pro Second Amendment community, I feel like we almost we get caught up in the weeds of certain things like, oh, well, maybe this bill actually will do good things. And we, we start to give credit to the other arguments. But in reality... The Second Amendment had a very specific purpose. It was to prevent a tyrannical government from taking over. That is the, per it's not self-defense, I mean, self-defense is an aspect, but in reality, the spirit of it wasn't about all these, you it wasn't know. wasn't about hunting. <laughs> it wasn't about hunting. It wasn't about all these things like, and even people who own guns like might get caught up in that whole argument. But if we don't know why our right actually exists, like it comes from God and all these, these different aspects it's crazy it's easy to get caught up and then you get in, in a whole debate and you get in a whole thing and then it becomes oh i could actually lose a debate and now it looks like this person's right when in reality it's one simple point that's the reason why we should keep these guns not because of all this extra stuff it's a great point hunter and what happens is we ha we suffer from stockholm syndrome right so for the last 40 50 60 years we have lived under certain aspects of gun control schemes and we begin to think like, oh, we, we think of our rights as a permission slip. Like, I wonder if I can carry my gun over there. I wonder if I can keep this gun in my house. I wonder if I can have this many rounds in my magazine. I wonder if I can purchase this particular firearm. And then we also have given into the incredibly unconstitutional logic that arms are should be regulated based on what good people can own. If you look at the American lexicon from 1791, when the, when the 
uh, Second Amendment was ratified, the definition of arms was any arm that can be used for offensive or defensive purposes. Mm. So that included armor, that included guns, that included swords, that included knives, that included any weapon that is Mm. suitable for offense or defense. And that's the part most people have already acquiesced in this whole debate of gun control. They say, nobody needs an AR-15. Why would anybody need an AR-15? Or other people will say, these are weapons of war. And it's like, yep, okay, I'll concede that point. Sure, if you want to take this and use it in war, it isn't the weapon we actually send our soldiers to war with, but I believe I should have the equivalent of what our soldiers carry in war. Right. Why? Because of what you just said. That's how you keep tyranny in check. It is literally the tyranny safety relief valve. And that's what, um, you know, and that's why they are fighting so hard to numb people over to the fact that they shouldn't have this high capacity magazine, semi automatic rifles of any kind, because they're too dangerous, right? Or they are the, the gun of choice for the mass shooter or whatever their intellectual argument is. The truth of the matter is I need to have the equivalent of what my government has or else we're right back in 1775 where my king says I can't own arms and I say I can and the king has more power than I do because I'm just the one guy, you know, peasant trying to make money to pay the taxes to the king. And yet the king has got an army, standing armies at the ready to go disarming. So if you want to create that two-tiered justice system or that two levels of government or the two class of people where you have the government ruling class that has all the guns and the, the monopoly on violence, and then you have the peasantry, which is there to serve the government, You know, we already had that war a long time ago. We don't need to do that again. All we need to do is remember that our rights, as you mentioned, are granted by our creator and therefore can't be taken away by man. Hmm. So how do you, and it's, it's very interesting that you said that because the whole debate when it comes to the Second Amendment is a battle of two different worldviews. One worldview says that human nature is naturally evil and will, when left to its own devices, will choose evil and violence. The other worldview says that people are basically good or morally neutral. And depending on their circumstances or their environment, they tend to do, uh, they tend to evil or they tend to good. Mm. And this is a battle of worldviews. The people, the pro two A people, uh, in my opinion, and also I believe the Bible's, you know, the, what the Bible says is that humans are naturally evil, and we will always we will always tend to do bad things. And but but the people who are trying to if, if you're taking, um, let's say, Michael Day, the one who presented this bill, if you're taking him, uh, if, if you want to believe the best about what he's doing, given the benefit of the doubt, you would just say, well, he has the worldview that whether he realizes it or not, that people are morally neutral or they're basically good. So if you take away their ability to access firearms, they will not be violent because he sees the firearm as the evil, not necessarily the person using the firearm. Right. And th- that's the battle of worldviews here. And that, that's so interesting. And, that, and when we understand that, that their argument just falls apart in the natural world, because the natural world operates off the things that the Bible says. So when people do bad things, they should be punished. And all throughout human history, people have done wrong things. And they, when left to their own devices, they will always go to evil. Mm-hmm. So to... To try to construct this world based on a faulty worldview of people not necessarily being good or bad, it just falls apart, and that causes, and that takes the uh, ability from that takes the ability from good people to protect, uh, you know, the, the women and children or their families from these evildoers. Right. It takes their ability away to do that, and when a violent criminal commits a crime, he should lose his natural rights. That's the whole idea of, of jail, is that for a time, for an agreed upon time, by a jury of your peers, by a judge, you're going, the, the, the rights of life, liberty, in pursuit of happiness, 
though all three of those to some capacity are taken away. Sometimes it's forever. Sometimes, you know, with capital punishment, you literally have your life taken away. Um, but that, that should not happen to people who have not committed crimes. Right. It should only happen to those who have committed crimes and have hurt people. I do believe that it's incredibly nuanced what you just said. The, the founders wrote that, um, and I can't remember, I should know, but I can't remember which founding father said this, but that the Constitution or our American way of government is for a moral and religious people. Right. Mm -hmm. It won't work if you remove that component. I believe self, that was John Adams. Yeah, self-governance doesn't work if you aren't a good and moral people. And that, as society begins to peel back the layers of that onion, that's exactly what we're seeing, right? So conceivably, things could devolve into a Mad Max type of situation if you remove morality from the situation. If just everyone has unfettered access to arms and nobody is morally good, then yeah, it's going to get ugly quick, right? It will have the purge on our hands. But the good news is we're nowhere near that, number one. Number two, um, I think getting back to what you were talking about, Michael Day, is there's a little bit of nuance to that as well because they infer by every law they pass that the presence of a firearm, A, makes everybody less safe, B, that gun owners make people less safe, mm. and nothing could be further from the true truth. The evidence is, in fact, just the opposite. When you have good people who own guns for personal protection, for, their, uh, for the common defense, to protect their family, their neighborhoods, their friends, then crime is at a very low level. Um, but when you have just the opposite, you make it hard for good people to possess arms, then crime skyrockets and rises. That's why you see heavily regulated areas like St. Louis and, uh, and Chicago and Compton and uh, even Boston. The whole time we went through this bill from HD 4420 to what it is now, we heard rhetoric and it was, Massachusetts is one of the safest places in America and it has the lowest gun to death ratio, like our laws are working. Well, actually, if you look statistically, we are the most violent state in New England. And since the last omnibus gun control legislation in 1998, we had 1.2 million gun owners in the state. Half of them are gone. We've seen a massive exodus from this state. Now we have 600,000 gun owners in the state of Massachusetts, just since 1998. Ironically, all that law that was passed in 98 and along the way as well, enforcement notices in 2016, violent crime with a gun is up 111%. Wow. So you can't do a victory lap saying how safe we are and how good our gun control is working when crime is going up. And with half of the gun owners that were here in 98. So that is a massive fail. Right. Yep. So half the people are gone and gun control uh, is off the charts and gun related crime or crime that uses a firearm is at the highest level we've ever seen. And we're the most violent state in New England where Maine, New Hampshire and Vermont are all constitutional carry states and have far less laws than we, even Rhode Island, uh, which does have some restrictions on magazine capacity, but you can buy whatever gun you want. Um, they are a much lower crime rate than us. So you can't have it both ways. You can't say that the gun laws work when the evidence shows it doesn't and try to do a victory lap with half the gun owners saying, you know, the people aren't going to stand for that. So they move to freer states, and that's what's happening. Right now we have a negative, uh, well, a net negative. There's more people leaving the state right. than moving here. And also they say New England's one of the, you know, they say, Massachusetts is like the safest state in the nation when it comes to gun to violence ratio. What it was a gun to what ratio? Gun to death ratio. Gun to death ratio. What about knife to death ratio? Or I don't know, like other means of hurting people. Like, well, one how, of the like, things they it... forget is where is Boston? It is in the 
probably the epicenter of the greatest health care trauma centers in the world. Right. There's the highest concentration of hospitals and trauma centers. And so just the truth of the matter is the amount of people getting shot is no different than most inner cities, right? And when they are minutes from a trauma center, a lot of times they survive. So there's no statistical data for like kind of bullet to skin contact. And so it's really, they're just tracking the mortality rates. But if this, if the crime that was happen, happening now in our city, uh, in Boston or, or surrounding areas happened out in the middle of the country at that same rate, there'd be a far higher death rate because people would be, you know, 45 minutes from a trauma center. But the fact that they're minutes away, their lives are being saved. And that's the part of the statistic that they don't track. That I think that statistic about since 1998, that statistic is just like a slam dunk to anybody that tries to justify any of these laws because right. it's like it's like imagine you're a you're a CEO and like you get hired to a business that makes 100 million dollars a year and after 20 years of you being the CEO, you like fired a bunch of people and now you make like 20 million dollars a year and you're like, "Well, oh yeah, I run a business that makes 20 million dollars a year." And whoa. everybody's like, whoa, great job. <laughs> but yet you cut your your profits or whatever by, you know, five. Right. And it's like, you can't say that. You can't make that argument. I don't think a lot of people know that because the propaganda machine of the media and, you know, we've been blue controlled for since decades. Forever. What, what was the percentage again of it, the crime that's dropped? 100 and 100 and, where Violent crime of the gun is up 111%, 111. since 1998. And that's with half of the gun owners that are licensed lawful gun owners. So they love That's to it. lay wow. yeah. they love to lay the violence with a gun at the feet of gun owners. And gun owners aren't the problem. If we were, you'd know it. And uh, the truth of the matter is it is a significant problem policy problem. So the roosters are all coming home to roost. The decade of low bail, no bail, and now Bail reform has even taken on a new level where they've gone, f I forget the, the amount, I think it was 30 to 90 to bail yourself out on personal recognizance, right? So they've tripled it. But guess what? The state pays it. So <laughs> now there's no personal recognizance. There's no tie to get the person back in court if the state's paying the bill. <laughs> and they're doing a victory lap saying, we just increased you know, the amount to bail yourself out or bond out or on your own personal recognizance. The problem is the state's picking up the tab. This guy doesn't need his 90 bucks back or whatever it is because he didn't pay it in the first place. So it's those kind of policies that are causing crime to go rampant. The fact that we let violent people out on personal recognizance in the first place is beyond the pale as far as I'm concerned. If you want to get down to real public safety issues, you would take the people who are committing the public safety problems and hold them accountable. Like, oh, bad guy number one who shot a lady or robbed somebody or broke into a house at night. Okay, you don't get to go home tonight. You're going to spend the night in jail. You're going to go to court. You may or may not be able to make bond or whatever. And, and right now our jails are empty. Um, Barnesville County House of Correction can hold over 500 inmates. They have about 150 inmates. Plymouth County House of Correction can hold 1,600 inmates. They have about 300 inmates, and they're the last county jail that still deals with ICE. So a bunch of the detainees there are ICE detainees. Mm. They're the only jails in, in the state that still deals with ICE, and they're, you know, they're not even a quarter full. And it's not for lack of criminals. It's for sure. lack of wanting to prosecute criminals. It's for lack of wanting to put pr criminals behind bars because it helps the narrative when criminals are on the street committing all kinds of crime with a gun of why we need more gun control. And that's what they've used to springboard on the you know sleeping masses that, oh my God, that's an awful thing that happened with a gun. And so, yeah, we need to ban more guns. That isn't the way this works. But that's what they, you know, perpetuate in the media. So it's controlled chaos, yes. basically. They're allowing, and they're actually allowing people to die, literally. Correct. So it's yeah. not even just a matter of like, it would be one thing if they were, you know, 
just taking our guns away. And that's bad enough, but now they're using people and allowing people to die to do it, which makes it way worse, in my opinion. I mean, obviously. 100%. I've long said that the blood doesn't lie on the hands of the gun owner. It is on the hands of the policy maker. Right. Mm -hmm. The mayors, the attorney generals, the district attorneys, the governors who refuse to punish violent crime, who refuse to uh, put real policies in effect that will immediately reduce violent crime. Because you could do that. You could right. do that overnight with everything that's already on the books. You don't need to pass a law. You don't need to come up with new policy. You don't need to do a thing. All you need to do is lock up violent felons. I wonder how much, I don't know if you know the number, but how many, quote unquote, gun crime, we got into that last time, how many, how much of gun crime is repeat offenders? I don't know if you know that number. If I were to guess, it would be a, a majority of them. So like, the same thing is they, they always want to say, oh, well, if we just, you know, if we had background checks and we locked all these people up, but yet they're the ones who don't want to lock, like, it's just completely a, a backwards worldview. And, and I hope that Massachusetts people wake up and realize, hey, you know, they're literally allowing people to die to advance their political agenda, which is literally tyranny. Like, there's no other, like, that's not a, that's not a buzzword. That's not a, you know... It's a reality. Yeah, it's not a right-wing fear-mongering. Like, this actually happens, and you can see it. And I think there's two, two sides to that coin. One is the people who are generally ignorant to the fact, and they just don't know that, you know, guns in the hands of lawful people are a good thing. They, they're just scared. It's called hoflophobia. They're, they're afraid of arms. Literally, they think that bad things are going to happen if there's a gun present. And I've heard them talk and, you know, they say, oh, I shouldn't be have to go to the playground with my grandkids and be there with someone who's got a gun. Well, number one, if they had a gun, you wouldn't even know it. Number two, what's the problem? Like, you didn't die, right? You <laughs> didn't know, like, nobody was threatening you with a gun. If you want to talk about the criminal who wants to come to the gun to the playground and mow down the playground with a gun, I'm on your side. Yeah, that guy Obviously. shouldn't be out. Yeah. But they're but You'll be rather thankful that that random dad had a gun there. Exactly. To defend all those kids from that violent criminal. So these are hoflophobic people. They really believe that just the presence of guns makes people less safe, even though statistically that's completely untrue. There's nothing uh, to support that. Then there are the people on the other side of the coin that are extremely nuanced and they do know um and they, they literally have nefarious intentions to ban guns and they're in it for the long game they're in it for the long haul they're willing to get take small wins along the way massachusetts gun control schemes are probably 40 50 years old um maybe even longer than 50 years old but let's just for sake of argument say 40 or 50 years old so here we are with this bill that just passed, that took 40 or 50 years to happen. It wasn't an overnight thing. This was incremental wins along the way and putting people to sleep and getting them numb to the fact that their, their rights were being eroded before their eyes by people who violate their oath of office, who do what is unthinkable while they're there. They literally commit malfeasance in their official capacity. They break the law by doing it, and nobody holds them accountable. And on election day, they, they just get reelected and they go back because they're such good people. And they feel, that, you know, they bring back the money from Washington or they bring back the money for their communities and they care, you know. And really, those are the more nefarious mm. and uh, evil, if you ask me, because they're so willing to violate their own conscience and to break their oath of office and the commission of their job, which constitutionally um, they are charged with going there to defend our rights, but instead they violate it and undermine them. How is this? How has this bill affected Cape Gunworks? Like, as the owner of Cape Gunworks, I'm just curious. Like, how are you guys doing? Like, is there is there a path forward? Like, how much of your inventory is have they has has Massachusetts just taken away from you? Uh, I don't. It's funny, I haven't pulled the official report yet, but um, I would say speculatively it's 30 to 40% of my business wow. that'll be gone and impacted. Um, and actually, I should back up. It's probably more like 
in the short term, it's probably more like 80 to 90% of my business because one thing a lot of people don't know is this bill has, and remember when we were talking about the differences between age 48, 4420, 40, um, there's some things that are a lot worse. Well, this is one of the a lot worse okay. things. So they added rifles and shotguns or redefined rifles and shotguns. Don't you just love it when firearm. they redefine words? Yeah. <laughs> so it used to be in this state that a firearm was a pistol or a shotgun or rifle with a barrel less than 18 inches and 16 inches respectively. So um, if the shotgun had a barrel less than 18, it was deemed a firearm. And any firearm was subject to the approved firearms roster. So we have this roster of guns that we can and can't sell in Massachusetts. It's more of the guns we can sell, but it's even more nuanced than that because there's guns on the roster that I can't sell because they violate the attorney general's regulations. But um, now they've redefined the word firearm in this new bill to include any shotgun and rifle. So what that means is now shotguns and rifles are subject to the approved firearms roster. And there's no shotguns and rifles on the approved shot firearms roster. So as of October 24th, the only guns we'll be able to sell in the shop is handguns that are on the approved weapons roster that don't violate the new law and also don't violate the attorney general's regulations. So that's probably about 20% of the guns that we sell right now. You can only sell handguns. As of October 24th. <laughs> because the they don't have a roster out yet saying what guns we can sell that are rifles and shotguns. That's crazy. And there's testing re requirements that are a part of that. And there's the tests that were developed were, were developed for handguns. So how do you subject a shotgun to the same test as a handgun. It's almost impossible. And a rifle to the same test as the handgun. So um, this is going to be real interesting to see how it plays out because, A, I don't know if the legislature is sophisticated enough to know that this even happened. Yeah. I highly doubt they are because <laughs> most – this bill came out on July 17th and it got voted in on July 18th. And it came out on – uh, from the conference committee on July 17th after 6 p.m., like 7 or 8 p.m., and it was voted into law by both houses on the 18th by 2 or 3 in the afternoon. That's so nefarious. Right. And so... Oh, my gosh. No so time So they didn't anything. read the 116 pages, and uh, yet, better yet, they didn't understand what's in the uh, 116 pages because if you read through it, so much of this is like... Uh, chapter 130, section 132, remove and replace the word, blah, blah, blah. So it doesn't, it, it doesn't read like a good story. It reads like, a, you know, uh, some crazy treasure hunt with cipher codes and stuff that you have to be like the most intelligent man on earth to even begin to put together and yeah. understand. Lawyers There's speak. teams yeah. of lawyers that have been going through this ever since it was passed and they still have questions. And so <laughs> to say that the people who voted for this bill knew this was in there, not a chance. Even the people who were proponents of this bill, there's nuance to this bill that they don't understand. So how can that be enforced? That's a great question. Because uh, before we started fil uh, filming, you, men you mentioned there were certain... What were the guns that can't be grandfathered in this bill? Was it all the guns that were mentioned or? No, um, there's a lot of guns that are grandfathered okay. as anything that was owned in the state by either an FFL or by an individual prior to 8-1. But <laughs> there's a group of guns that were sold after 7-2016 until 8-1 that by my understanding of the law are now illegal to possess, even though tons of people owned them legally. And what's going to happen with all those? You know, those mm. there's a big group of guns. There's probably tens of thousands of them in the state. And are we going to just charge everybody there with, you know, unlawful possession? So um, the enforcement of this is virtually impossible. Um, the other side of it is there's no money in the bill. This was an unfunded mandate. And when 
the people opposed to the bill brought that up. They said, like, you're violating rule, I think it was rule 10 or something like that. I can't remember the exact word, uh, rule it was, but you can't pass an unfunded mandate in the state. Like, you got to attach funding mechanism to it. So they went, yeah, you're right. Let's vote to suspend the rule so that we can pass the law. <laughs> and so they did that. They suspended the rule so that they could pass That's the insane. law. And now they're saying to the state police, hey, you have to write the curriculum for the new training requirements. You got to write what the test is going to be. You got to write what the course of fire is going to be. You got to write what the de-escalation techniques are going to be. And the state's going, state police are like, oh yeah, with, with what? You know, uh, They don't have the money. They right. don't have the staff. The, this, yeah. this bill will cost the state hundreds of millions of dollars oh for implementation gosh. with yeah. with portals that aren't made, with registrations that aren't uh, fleshed out, with the uh, staffing, with the, you know, regulations and requirements that, you know, so it's an unfunded mandate. I don't know where the state's getting the money to so do it. So th th last HD 4420, you said something that blew my mind. All 351 towns, the police, the, the chiefs of police at all three, 351 towns said they would not enforce HD 4420. They wouldn't support it. They wouldn't yet. support it. Yep. Wouldn't support it. Will they? So, I mean, it's, I think it's safe to say that a large number of local police stations are not going to be enforcing this. Would you say that's safe to say? So now is, this, is it on the state police to just like, if they take this bill literally, are they just going to start doing raids on all these people who own? No, I don't think they're going to be doing raids. <laughs> Because uh, that, that would, would be the tip off of World War III. Oh, I, I mean, know. or like, the, that's what I'm saying. It's you like, know, 1776. That's how, that's how irresponsible this bill is. Right. That they're opening, but they're even that they're even cracking that door open a little right. bit. Right. The way this bill will be enforced is, um, and I wish I could side with you saying 351 towns won't enforce it, but there, a lot of them will. Unfortunately, there were police carve outs that were put into this bill that weren't in 4420. So that's one reason the police were opposed to it. It wasn't just the fact that it's completely unconstitutional and that, um, if I can remember to circle back to it, that presents another whole bunch of challenges for police. What do you mean by um, police carve out? So now in this bill, police are exempt. So they can still buy assault weapons, high capacity magazines. Oh, so police officers. Police officers, individual gotcha. officers, not just in their official capacity, they are exempt. So therefore... Um, some of the chiefs of police in the chiefs of police association acquiesced and said, okay, we can now stand behind this bill and say, I really don't like that. Yeah. <laughs> Cause that either. is now creating a bigger divide between exactly. those who have the authority mm -hmm. to arrest us and take our lives away and the yeah. people. And so how this really presents a problem for police officers is the legislature can hide behind something called constitutional immunity they uh, or legislative immunity. They um, can't be sued for acting in their official capacity under the color of law, even if, and this is something that blows my mind, even if, and maybe I'm wrong about this and I hope I am, but even if they're violating our rights, which they did in this bill, then there's a federal statute called Title 18, Section 242, which basically says that any official acting under the color of law that deprives somebody of their constitutionally protected rights can be fined or imprisoned or mm. both up to and including the death penalty if their actions lead to the death of somebody. Wow. And the legislature is immune from this because... I understand why the founders put this in the Constitution, because every law that they pass, there's going to be some group that's going to be offended by it and want to sue them over it, right? Yeah. So they would be spending their entire life of you know, litigating um, in court yeah. for the laws that they passed. However, if they do overstep the Constitution that they swore to uphold and protect against all enemies, both foreign and domestic, personally, I feel they should lose that legislative immunity and should be able to be sued. Yeah, I stand alone on that rock, <laughs> I guess, because everyone's like, yeah, it's not going to happen. So that's a federal statute? That's a federal then, statute. But the state statute overrules it? No. So in both cases, federally or state, they are 
immune to prosecution for the laws that they create. Mm. Right. However, the police as the executive branch are not. The executive branch gets sued all the time, right? Uh, we see uh, most lawsuits like that are pro 2A lawsuits name the governor or the attorney general as the plaintiffs in the case that we're suing against for enforcing unconstitutional laws. There's, they're still protected by immunity for, um, for that. However, the police on the street get their qualified immunity uh, taken away whenever they deprive somebody of their constitutional rights. So you see it a lot in traffic stops or in, you know, serving warrants if they violate somebody's um, constitutionally enumerated rights then they have their quali qualified immunity stripped and now they are personally and severably liable for paying that fine or being held uh, accountable in a court of criminal court. So the legislature is literally putting the police in a pickle here by saying, here's our unconstitutional laws, go enforce them. And yet they're the ones who sw also swear an oath to protect the Constitution. So when they violate your right... We can sue the police. We can sue the police. not the legislators. Right. Yeah. So that's something I would say to police chiefs. You better think twice about right. how you're going to enforce this or have your, your police officers enforce this because you're putting them in harm's way for... Law f uh, for lawsuits that are going to challenge their qualified immunity for depriving us of our right to keep and bear arms. Yeah, this needs to be like a moment for the the police chiefs and things like that. Like they need to be public about this and like because you know the media. If the police chiefs are like you know we can't enforce this bill, the media is just going to go and say, oh look, the the police are doing all these bad things. Oh, here's another reason to defund the police. Here's another reason Maura Healy is going to probably do a million dollar campaign or whatever saying, oh, look at this state, uh, this police chief. They're not enforcing the laws. You know, they're not upholding their duty to the whatever, whatever, the gods of, of the Democratic Party. <laughs> and it's like, this is a, this should be a moment for, for people who believe in freedom to be like, this is not your, your, grandma's gun control bill like this is outrageous this is absurd Un like the amount of like points that you can make like it's unconstitutional here it's unconstitutional there and you know the constitution says no ex post facto laws which means not after the fact so the grandfathering in provision would be like okay so now you're making it illegal for me to you know own a gun that when i bought it it was legal for me so how like that's a, another one that's just a blatant as a side note um but, and it almost seems stupid on their part, which is interesting and maybe to go down another rabbit hole, is that October, what was it, October, it goes into effect. 24th, yeah. Election day is what, two weeks after that? So to me, it seems like this is a perfect storm for like a red wave in Massachusetts because, I mean, I don't know, are gun stores going to go out of business? I'm, there, there has to be gun stores that are going to go out of business because of this, right? No question about it. Jobs will be uh, lost livelihoods will be lost and they could care less about that because we have Carlos Gonzalez and Bud Williams, which proposed a law to ban the manufacture of any gun that can't lawfully be sold in Massachusetts. So what did that do? It drove Smith and Wesson right out of the state. It drove Troy Industries right out of the state. Um, so these were two major manufacturers of weapons that provided thousands of jobs and their own state rep is proposing laws to put them out of business. And this is exactly what they want. They, but they could care less about the jobs lost in their own communities. Wait a minute. You were just sent to represent me, and now you're taking my job away. That's the way this works, right? And so you bring up an excellent point about what should happen on Election Day. And I would argue that there are a lot of liberal gun owners out there. There are people who are um, not your typical, you know, right winger, right? They, and they, I, I've had this conversation with many of them that on a list of one to 10, what is the most important thing on election day? The second amendment is number nine through 11 for the, for the liberal gun owner. For the 
conservative gun owner, it's probably four to six, right? It's it, you know, I would argue it might even be top five all the time, but for sake of argument, let's say it's four to six on the one to 10 list. There's some people like myself where it's number one, because I recognize once the second amendment is gone, then so are the rest of the, it's only a matter of time before the rest of the rights are gone. And we're like England getting locked up for what we say on Facebook. Right. And so, um, I, I make that point and they instantly acquiesce and say, yeah, you're right. We don't hold our politicians accountable at the ballot box because if we vote for the right winger, then we get all the other stuff we don't like. However, Massachusetts is a very unique situation where we could absolutely hold them accountable, change over 40 or 50 percent of the incumbents and still affect the politics of Massachusetts to the 0% degree, right? You could literally change over 40 or 50% of the legislature, and it probably wouldn't even be a ripple in the pond as far as how politics actually change in action. And so I would urge those who might be uh, not a conservative but still believe in their right to keep and bear arms to, to hold their politicians accountable on election day and say, you done screwed up, a a Ron, and you know I'm gonna vote you out because, you know you violated my constitutionally enumerated rights. So sure. it's a strategy worth worth employing in in this state that, as you point out, is is very blue. You know we could still see uh, the blue wave hold those people accountable, and yet still end up that you're not gonna change the politics of Massachusetts overnight. So let's let's get into the specifics of H four eight eight five. I have like a quick summary here. I'm just gonna like you were saying, this this uh, this bill runs the gamut of everything to do with guns. It has every like, it's just a complete omnibus bill. So it deals with licensing of firearms. Um, there are now firearm dealer inspections. Have you have you heard about this? What 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 is the what's going on with? So now people can just officials can just walk into Cape Gunworks and technically they could once a year anyway, and we're supposed to like the local police were supposed to come in, and um, it's actually kind of funny because when our police department used to do this and and probably still does to a certain extent, they do. Uh, but let's just I don't want to get anyone in trouble these days. But years ago when we first opened. I would have the firearms official for the town come in and say, what am I supposed to be doing? They had no idea (laughs) what they're supposed to inspect, you know, and I'd say, all right, well, why don't you just spot check a few guns in the case? I'll show you where it is in my bound book. Uh, I'll show you a couple of, um, you know, gun guns that were uh, sold and are no longer here. And I'll show you how we dispose them correctly, you know, that type of thing. And after five or 10 minutes, they'd be like, all right, looks like you're doing everything right. You know, fist bump, see you next year. You know, that was the way it was. Well, most towns didn't even do that because they really didn't know what they were doing. There's no official training by the state on how to perform these inspections. Plus it's very redundant because the feds do it and the feds go through with a microscope. Like this is a uh, massive inspection when it happens. The by feds the feds that come through here. Oh yeah, the ATF comes through, and they can they can come through once a year. They 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 don't even have to announce. They sometimes call as a courtesy, like, "Hey, we're on our way. We're in the car. We'll be there in ten minutes." And then they show up with six agents, and they want to see our books for our annual inspection. The last time that happened, I had five agents show up, and they were here for about two and a half months going through our every gun in the store, every firearms transaction on the paper forms and our bound book. So that happens. It's like the literal (laughs) and the irony is they hold us to a standard that they themselves can't keep. They can't keep this the same standards that we are forced to keep. And right now there's a zero tolerance task force by the Biden administration that um, has resulted in 500% revocation hearings for FFLs in the last couple of years. Wow. A 500% increase. And it's usually for grammatical or clerical errors. It's not for this guy sold a gun to a prohibited person. It's not that. It's, oh, you didn't um, 
dot your T's and you know cross your eyes. You know what I mean? So they're so. they're taking away people's <laughs> rights to sell guns for grammatical errors. Is that one of the yeah? So the way it works <laughs> is like if you abbreviate your town. If you lived in Los Angeles and on the form you wrote L.A. instead of wrote out Los Angeles, that's a violation. <laughs> gun dealer, if they don't catch that and they're warned about it in one of those inspections, if it ever happens again, it is a willful violation. So the fact that they didn't catch it means they are willfully violating the law. They're doing it on purpose, even though like <laughs> 15 people that inspected that form, just it, they missed it. And also, how, do, how by law do you judge intent? That's like one of the hardest hardest things to prove in the court in a court of right. law is intent. Right. But they don't care about that. And they and <laughs> right. they well the government says right. so. Yeah. yeah. So basically once you've been warned once by the ATF about a violation, then if you ever violate that way again, you're willfully violating the law. And then close and that down. can immediately lead to a revocation hearing. When I heard about the Joe Biden zero tolerance task force that was being enacted and, and assembled, I knew exactly what was going to happen. And I predicted it on my podcast. I said, you watch. They are going out there like the soldiers on a white horse to, to make it sound like they're on a crusade to shut down bad gun dealers for selling guns to the biker gangs and to the Crips and the Bloods. And when they find that they can't find gun dealers that are doing that, they have to save face for the tens of millions of dollars that have been spent on their zero tolerance task force. And they're going to shut down dealers for the grammatical, willful violations of, you know, things that used to be just a warning letter by the ATF. Right. Now they're a revocation hearing. So the question you gave me was, how does the state get involved? Well, now in this new law, they're trying to say that they can come into a gun store and inspect their records Anytime for any reason. So whenever they want. Whenever they want, not yep. just one time a year, but it can be every anytime. day if they wanted. Yep. They could Isn't come in every time, every day, and go through our records and try to look for somebody or something that should And also have what happened. a great way to deter business too. Right. <laughs> like scare the scare the crap out of your customers. Yeah. Like Isn't yeah. there like <laughs> this thing called the, um, the Fourth Amendment or something? Where it's like no illegal search and seizures. Yeah. Is that a thing anymore? Or? Uh, not when you're a gun dealer, uh, apparently. And it's funny because, um, oh man, we could go down a rabbit hole about <laughs> Let's this. Let's do it. I don't even care. All right. So <laughs> this is worth it. This is crazy. I had an ATF agent in my, and so the, the guys who do those inspections are, they're called IOIs. They're investigative officers and inspectors, right? I'm just curious. Do they feel bad? Like, are they ever like, just <laughs> Imagine being like, sorry guy. about yeah. this, but Kinda, we have to? Yeah, they actually are. Th okay. Those ATF agents are like, we're just doing our job. We've got to make sure this gun lines up with this serial number in this book and this 4473 to this guy and his license is correct and his address was right and his signature's on the page and you have your, you know, employee signature too and all that, right? And again, they can't even keep to the standard that themselves, but they require us to and we do. And so they do the inspections. Then they write up a list of violations and then they send that to their director and then the director determines what action will be taken. Uh, you know, a letter, a warning conference or a revocation hearing. And so that happens once a year-ish. And then the other side of it is enforcement. So there's the ATF enforcement side, which are actively doing investigations into the biker gang or the Crips and the Bloods with guns, you know, or the, the nefarious people out there that legitimately do evil with guns. But, you know, they also wear a big badge. And so funny story is we had an investigation going on a few years ago. It was actually a pretty well-known investigation. It was in the newspapers of a guy who was in the police academy to become a cop who purchased a Glock pistol from our store and from another store by showing a police ID and signing our law enforcement affidavit that he had powers of arrest. And it turns out he was just a dispatcher. And um, so we can't sell Glock pistols, the number one selling handgun in America, to regular citizens because the attorney general deemed them too dangerous. So that whole list of guns I told you about, the attorney general's regulations, 
they determined that Glock pistols do not meet the attorney general's regulations. But then they exempted police departments and police from the attorney general's regulations. So if that doesn't stink of hypocrisy, I don't know what does, because um, the they're saying it's too unsafe for you to own, but yet we're going to give them to cops in their official duties, and also they can own them personally. But if they're that unsafe, why do we want to give them to cops? Well, because they're really not unsafe. We just don't trust you with the most popular handgun in America, and this is our way of doing a backdoor gun ban. So you can't buy Glocks, but you can as a cop. So this guy who's going through the police academy um, flashed his thing and and – when he's in the police academy, the police chief looks at him and says, hey, that looks like a new Glock. Where'd you get that? Oh, I got it at Cape Gunworks. What? You can't do that. You can't buy that. You're not a sworn officer yet. So this police chief launches an investigation and charges the kid with uh, you know, unlawful possession of a firearm for straw purchase stuff and gets the ATF involved. Wow. So the ATF comes down to us to get the form, the 4473, he shows us his credentials. And uh, some of you might un know who this ATF agent is if you watched a very high-profile trial that just took place in Massachusetts. So uh, it, it, the, the agent's name was uh, Brian Higgins. And so he's in our shop to get this form, and he's watching us conduct business. And he sees a girl at the counter buying a gun. She's doing her paperwork, doing all that. And her boyfriend walks in and you know whispers in her ear, and she points over there and then... He walks away, and uh, this guy's observing this whole thing. And then she finally gets her gun, and she leaves. And he says, I need to see that 4473. And I'm like, hmm, I've never been in this position before. Uh, like, I don't just feel comfortable turning over my customer's information to law enforcement agencies yeah. just because they ask for it. Yeah, you need so, a warrant. So I'm like, yeah, I think there's a warrant and a and a, uh, or a subpoena at the very least that there's some ongoing investigation. So I bring the form into my general manager and I go in the other room and I ask Brendan, my business partner, I said, do we have to give federal f forms to the ATF upon demand? And he goes, I don't think so, but let me call our lawyer. We have a lawyer that is on call about, you know, about this type of stuff, especially interactions with the ATF. So he calls him, and this guy used to be one of the directors of the Boston field office of the ATF. Mm. So he knows his stuff, yeah. right? So um, he he calls him, and meanwhile, while we're off to the side talking, this ATF agent goes into my manager's office and says, I need to see that form. So my manager doesn't know any better, and he hands it over, and he's taking pictures of it and you know, writing down information off this form. And then he walks back out. I come out, and Brendan is on the phone with the lawyer and the lawyer says, and I'll keep it a G rating here, but he says, tell him to go bleep himself. And uh, so, <laughs> and so Brendan comes out and says, uh, yeah, we're not going to give you that information. I'm sorry. Come back with a warrant or a subpoena or something like that. And we'll be glad to oblige, but you know, we don't feel comfortable giving out confidential information just on a fishing expedition by you. And he goes, what? He hits the moon. No one has ever denied me that form. And that's ATF property. Those forms are ATF property. And we're like, no, they're actually not. We have to retain them as records for 20 years, you know, forever. And uh, he's like, nope, that's my property. I can inspect them whenever I want. I want to see that now. And by the way, I already looked at it in your manager's office, so I already got what I need, but you don't tell me no. He was really upset. So did he told you that he already got it? Yeah, he manager? told us okay. that he already got it. I'm like, well, I didn't give you permission or authorize you to do that. And, um, you know, frankly, I think you're overstepping your bounds here. And we're very pro-police. We'll, we'll, we'll help any investigation, but I believe you're on a fishing expedition and you just don't like the color of the skin or, or what that person looked like who's at the counter buying a gun. Frankly, that's what I think happened here. And he goes you don't know why I'm asking for it. And I said, well, I'm just calling it like I see it. And we internally knew this wasn't a straw purchase. If he was making the argument that she was buying the gun for the boyfriend or something like that, uh, that's what he was implying. And I said, nope, that's not the situation. This girl has been in multiple times, 
has gone out on the range with an instructor to select a handgun that fits her hand, that one she likes, that you know meets the requirements that she has. She's uh, you know test fired it. She's narrowed it down, and then ultimately made a selection. And today is the day she's picking it up. This is not a straw purchase, and. Um, so he's like, well, you don't, I'm not going to talk to you about what an ongoing investigation. So he gets back to his office and his director just got reamed out by my lawyer who used to work for that office. And, um, he ba basically tells him, you got to make this right. You got to cover your butt because you're, you're exposed now you're out there in the wind without any legal protection because you're, you know, demanding this. And, so he open he goes and assembles a grand jury to investigate this girl what? For, for a straw purchase <laughs> and um, comes back to us with a subpoena on a Saturday or Sunday morning. I can't remember what day it was. When we have a instructor here from New York to teach a class to like 14 people, people have driven from like Connecticut and Rhode Island and uh, all over Massachusetts to be in this class. And he shows up with like eight police cars and he walks in. And he disarms everyone in the store. Like, you can't be in the store with me with a gun. I want your gun. And like, so my employees are kind of like, what do I do? And so he's like, you got to, you know, unload your gun and, and I'll hold on to it while you're in the store. And by the way, I want everyone out anyway. You can't be in the building with me at the same time while I'm conducting my investigation. And he has a subpoena for the hard drive of our video camera surveillance system. So we can sit there and watch the world go by in 30 second clips, you know, um, around that day. But he doesn't just ask for the clips for that day. He takes the whole server out of the building. And um, this could have been done by just him walking in that one closet which is like a four by six closet, but he shut down the entire operation of the building, you know, and with like eight cruisers parked out front. So it looks like we're, you know, Getting selling raided, machine yeah. guns yeah. to kids out the back door. <laughs> and um, and so That's great. all that to really just throw his weight around and peacock out and say, I'm the guy, you don't ever tell me no, don't you ever forget it. And um, so he did that to cover his butt because you know, and then once they found out, oh yeah, it wasn't a straw purchase. They just closed the investigation and went on as business as usual. So it was crazy. But how do you not sue them over that? <laughs> well, because technically he got a subpoena, so technically yeah, it was legal. Right. Yeah, technically it was, and and uh, you know, uh, frankly, um, it was a small p price to pay for a cool story. If you ask me, oh, like, <laughs> for sure. you know what I mean? Like, not that I would ever want to go no. through that again. Yeah, but it just shows the level of tyranny that'll happen. And that's what makes me yeah. a little nervous about saying there's not any cops that'll enforce this because cops will do things that aren't constitutional. Yeah. And frankly, uh, you know, that makes me a little nervous. Well, and following orders, you know. And it's dangerous too, because what happens when you get a gun store or somebody who's not as willing to go along with the ATF? Like what if somebody's like, no, actually, like this is an unconstitutional not that i'm not saying i don't know how many of those i'm sure there's some people who are willing to take a stand at that level and it's like now you're gonna have like a you could have a standoff at some level and it's like mm. that's dangerous like that you could get people could lose lives you could have like a waco situation or, or things like that the reason gun owners action league called this bill the lawful gun owner imprisonment act is the scenario that you're just explaining Basically, this type of legislation points the barrel of government-directed violence at lawful, peaceful citizens. Right. And that's it. That's the only segment of society that this affects. The criminal element doesn't go get licensed, doesn't care what gun they buy, doesn't care how many rounds are in their gun, will manufacture it any way, shape, or form they can. I don't care how many laws you pass to, to punish the criminal element. It only affects them in a responsive way after they've committed a crime. It doesn't ever prevent crime from being committed in the first place. And it only affects those who are worried about losing their Second Amendment rights, right? I mean, that's really what it is. It's the gun of government violence directed at peaceful and lawful people. And it almost feels like entrapment in a way, because you're like, you're basically asking somebody who's lawful, like you're going to, who's not going to be upset by that? You know right. what I mean? And you're like, people are going to do irrational things because of this. They're going to, they're going to panic. They're going to be afraid. And obviously they shouldn't, 
but just naturally knowing people and it's like you just you've created you know criminals out of thin air which is one of the worst things that government can do so yeah what is um just for the average person watching this just curious about this bill or like okay you know, should I buy a gun now so it can be grandfather? Just like the average person who's confused, they they want to do what's what's best for their family and protect their family. Like, what are like, let's say like the three biggest takeaways from H four eight eight five? Just for the average person to understand mm -hmm. and to be able to use it almost like an argument if they're if they're in, in a debate or or uh, something like that. How it really affects the gun owner yeah, is, yeah. is yeah. number one. If you're not a gun owner yet it's going to increase the amount of requirements necessary to, you know, put more hoops to jump through in order to exercise your right to keep and bear arms. It's already outrageous what is required of us, and it's totally unconstitutional. Um, there's, a, there's a Supreme Court decision called Murdoch v. Pennsylvania, 1943, and that was a First Amendment case that required licensing in order to go sell religious materials. And that court found it to be unconstitutional. And in their uh, majority opinion, they wrote that you cannot sell a license, charge a fee, issue a permit, or tax the lawful exercise right. of your constitutional rights. Um, no state or county official or federal official can do that. Yet here we are, right? So not only are they violating the constitutional rights in the original document, but they're violating precedent right. of an actual court 100%, decision. 100%, yes. And have been <laughs> that for is damning decades. evidence. <laughs> and have been for de decades. And um, so there's that. So that's number one, licensing for people who aren't licensed yet. Um, and again, licensing in and itself is unconstitutional. Mm -hmm. um, the... I think it's the Hamden, Radical. Hamden Radical. County <laughs> Hamden County Courthouse says liberty without license right on the front of the courthouse. And, you know, that's exactly how it is. It's, is it a right if you have to ask permission? No. no. Is it a right if you have to pay a fee, get background checked, fingerprinted, photographed, tell a reason why, go speak with a chief and ask permission? No, none of that, you know. And people have acquiesced that to the point where they think, Oh yeah, I'm I'm not opposed to that. You know, it's like, are you for it with any other right? Like, are you gonna be okay with issuing a license to go to church or to vote in the poll? Oh wait, that's racist. We can't do that. So you can't require a, a license to vote, but you can to buy a gun. You know, I don't see how these. It's a two tiered justice system, right. and, and as Clarence Thomas wrote, that the Second Amendment has become a disfavored right. Mm. And they apply a whole different set of standards to it because of that. So that's first. Second is um, they have violated 18 to 20-year-olds' rights by saying you can only buy a certain type of weapon now. So you can't buy a handgun and you can't buy a semi-automatic rifle or shotgun. You can only buy bolt action, lever action, pump action, slide action, single shot, that type of weapon. So... Um, you can go serve in your military, you can vote in elections, you know, you're a, an adult by every aspect of the law, except when it comes to firearms, you're still an adult with an asterisk and, you know, you can't exercise your right to keep and bear arms. And you want to talk about precedent. What was the precedent in 1795? It was all able-bodied men, 17 and older, can be called to muster in the militia for the common defense, right? So if you're if you can be called upon to take up arms for the defense of your country or defense of your community, how can you not take it up for the, the defense, defense of your personal property family. Or, or family? Yeah. yeah. Um, so that's another huge, huge issue. And that's the one that goes back to the Fifth Amendment where you can't deprive someone of their property without due process. There's people who are 18, 19, 20-year-olds right now that own semi-automatic rifles and shotguns and where does that leave them? So October 24th, when this goes into effect, are they going to have to surrender it, sell it to a friend or a father or a, a relative, or uh, do they have to surrender it to the police or whatever? You know that, and the law doesn't even speak to what they have to do. So the law doesn't come into effect till October 24th. Yeah, 90 days after Maury Haley signed it. Yep. And then thirdly, I think 
um, the doubling down on uh, bad law, which is that a a district judge, Judge Saylor, S-A-Y-L-E-R, I believe is how you spell his name, just ruled in Massachusetts federal district court that the Massachusetts assault weapons ban is constitutional. And, you know, he even says that it meets the Bruin mandate, which Obviously. the Bruin mandate is the way that all courts are required now to look at Second Amendment issues. You look at the text first. If there's no provision in the text for the law that you are trying to pass or uphold or overturn, then the burden of proof shifts to the government to prove that there was a law at the time of the ratification of the Second Amendment in 1791 that is analogous. Mm. It's, a, it's a carbon copy of the law that stands today that you're trying to either enforce, uphold, or overturn. And then it can be ruled constitutional. If no such law exists at the, in the founding era, then it's unconstitutional. So how he can look at the ban on magazine capacity and uh, our assault weapons ban and say that it is constitutional is, you know, basically looking at the law with your hands over your eyes. It 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 doesn't. It's impossible to come to that conclusion. But he's an activist judge and he's just doing it to, because this is the worst place to take arms ban cases up in Massachusetts District Court and the. First Circuit Court of Appeals. So the good news is that will be um, probably done away with at mm. some point through the Supreme Court. But um, yeah, so those are kind of the three things that I think uh, really affect the person, the gun owner in Massachusetts going forward. And it's sad to boil it down to three things because there's so many different ways you can get jammed up in this. And um, yeah. And the law doesn't go into effect until October 24th. So right. do with that what you will. Yeah. And <laughs> um, that date is important in a couple of reasons. So one is we have initiated a recall mm -hmm. of this bill. And um, the first 10 signers for the recall petition went to the state house on, uh, I forget the actual date. It was last Thursday. But uh, we petitioned the government to recall this bill. Nice. And what that looks like is um, we need to get f roughly 50,000. It's like 49,713 or something like that. But 50,000 signatures from registered voters in throughout the state. It can't be more than 25% from any one county. But throughout the state, and if we get that number of signatures submitted before October 23rd that are certified, then... Um, this bill will be put on hold until the next biennial election, which is 2026. So that gives us basically two years of this bill being put on ice. So this is really important. Hmm. So it wouldn't be on the ballot this year. No. It would be on the ballot in 2026. Yeah. Okay, so that's he so if we all can get it, those amount of signatures, right? So okay. all it takes is fifty thousand signatures to over basically not override but f override for two years, and then it'll in twenty twenty six, it'll suspend the bill from being wow that's put big. into effect. Yes, so it gives us time to develop two years, lawsuits and right? Things like yeah, that. two yeah. years to fight it in court challenges, and also it goes up to the voter at that point. So it's a ballot initiative. It's, it's a ballot in, question in on the on the. Yeah, on the 2026 okay. election, there'll be a ballot question, yeah. which I can already tell you what the language is going to read because <laughs> the attorney general writes the language. It's going to say, a yes vote for this will make our streets safer. It'll bring back the Care Bear stare and, you know, it'll make unicorns reappear. <laughs> a no vote for this will mean you want to kill children and let blood run through the gutters of our streets, you know. And so pick accordingly, you know, that's the way this is going to read. So we have to do our part mm -hmm. to get the word out that, hey, your rights have just been trampled on, unconstitutionally violated by oath-breaking tyrants. Why does he get to write that? Uh, the attorney general, that's just the way it is. That's... They, that's, they get to write the language and they're not on our side. So no. they're yeah. going to, no, they're, they're going to, uh, it's Andrea Campbell is the attorney general. She's not a pro-gun, you know, attorney general. So 
anyway, the um, long and short of it is uh, if we can get this bill suspended, then that's the best case scenario. Right. Uh, so it goes two years. A lot can happen in two years. Like I said, we're probably going to have a um, we're probably going to have a Supreme Court ruling on an assault weapons ban case in the next term because the Maryland uh, it's Bianchi v. v Brown, I believe, um, now has a final judgment in the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals. So what that means is uh, the Fourth Circuit has upheld. Um, Maryland's assault weapons ban. And they ruled as a final judgment they're not remanding it back to the district court. So um, that enables us to petition the Supreme Court for writ of certiorari, which this particular bill has already been there, or this particular challenge has already been there, and they said, we're not going to rule on an interlocutory nature. It has to be a final judgment. So We've been waiting for a final judgment case, and here it is. It was served up on a silver platter a couple weeks ago or a week ago. So now that we have that, it's likely the Supreme Court will take mm. an arms ban case this term, uh, mm. 24, 25 term. So a lot can happen in two years. Yeah. A large part portion of this bill could probably go away just by the nature of the Supreme Court ruling. Um, so that's what I'm hopeful for. Yeah. You know, But I'll... I'll I also don't have a problem leaving it up to the voters. And a lot of people are like, you're crazy. We're going to have a bloodbath on election day because the voters are going to vote this law in. Maybe, maybe they won't. If we do a good enough job educating them that your rights have been violated, and if they can do that to the Second Amendment, what other right are you willing to violate right. the same way? Yep. Maybe people will start to realize, hey, wait a minute. Yeah, I think there's a Constitution document somewhere in here that means they can't do that but if they do vote it in there was a ballot initiative in oregon called 114 that the people did vote in to law that's very similar to the one that the legislature just passed here in massachusetts so if the people are like you know i hate our rights i'm gonna vote them away on election day and they do that it's still not that big a deal because we can't do that either. Yeah, right. You said you the judge overturned that yeah, one in Oregon. the judge overturned okay. that. That We can't vote away our own rights, yeah. and nor can the legislature. Mm. Uh, the only thing that can do that is a constitutional amendment. Right. And so that's not happened. Yeah. So how can somebody watching sign that petition? What's the, the best way they can go about so that? So because we just submitted it last Thursday, the state has two weeks to to generate the language. So really it's about 10 days left on that stopwatch before the petitions are issued. So once the petitions are issued, we're gonna be sounding the alarm as to yep. where to sign, how to mm. sign. There's also a huge rally on the green at Boston Common at the Parkman Band Stand on the 24th of uh, August. So this is, I'll be speaking there. There's a whole lineup of speakers and it's going from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. all day event. Um, so we're hoping a lot of people come to this rally and, and get the message out. And we're hoping to make that the kickoff to mm. sign these petitions mm. because um, we'll have so many people in one place. It'll be easy, uh, easy to gather signatures, but you gotta be registered to vote and write legibly and the, right. ballot, and the question has to be on two-sided paper and it can't have any extraneous marks or highlight a lighting or you know numbers on it and stuff like that or letters i should say can have some numbers but um yeah it's a, it's kind of a lot of so can any person print that out and collect signatures once it's issued yes okay but it'll have to be done like you're gonna have to uh be vigilant about recording them by right. town so it's it's you got to keep them all together by town, because once we get all uh, all the petitions back, we're shooting for like the twenty first. They have to be brought to each town to be certified. So this town is what to the looks at clerk. Joe Schmo's signature, says, "Yep, he's registered to vote. He's good to go." They go kind of line by line, and if you know some dude from Suffolk County is on the Barnstable County, that is going to get crossed off and it won't count. If there's extraneous marks on the 
on the petition, they throw the whole thing away. So we could have 50 signatures on one thing, but if someone like underlines something or puts a number on there or, or uh, highlights a section of the bill that we want to call attention to, that whole thing gets tossed. Mm. So we got to be really careful about how we collect the signatures and they got to be done by town for certification. After the town certifies that these signatures are good, now they got to be uh, reallocated by county. So when we submit them to the state, it's all by county. Mm. So we got to, you know, it's not going to be 351 folders with all the different towns. It's going to be the county folders with all the different towns per county in that folder. That's how we submit them to the Secretary of the Commonwealth. So this is an easy opportunity to, like, if you want to get politically involved, just yes. go and get signatures. Every RTC yeah. needs to have... I'm, I'm Great about, idea. Yeah. I want to go do a speaking tour at the RTCs and tell them that if you're not doing this, you need to revoke your uh, citizenship <laughs> or whatever. Yeah, but. no, I love that you just said that because that's exactly what this is. It's a grassroots mm -hmm. effort where we can activate everybody, even people who aren't gun owners who are like, yeah, I don't care about the Second Amendment per se. I mean, I like the law. I like the theory of the law, but I'm never going to own a gun. So what? Like, we need your signature because... If they can do it to the second, they can do it to the first and the fourth and the fifth and every other amendment, right? So we're going to need to go on a massive signature campaign. And this is everybody who comes in the shop or chomping at the bit. What can I do? You know, what can be done about this? Guess what? You can sign. Yeah. A, you can register to vote. I have people that are messaging us saying, I've never voted before. I'm a sportsman. I'm a hunter. I'm a gun owner. But I've never voted I just registered to vote just so I can sign this petition. Mm, nice. And it's like, thank God, you know, yeah. and, and by the way, while you're <laughs> at it, vote on November 5th or <laughs> September 3rd uh, and, you know, hold the knuckleheads accountable that voted for this. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Man. This is a huge, this is huge. Like, I mean, this is like, this could help upstream the ballot all the way to the governor's race in 2026. I mean, that could, this could be like a winning issue because there's 600,000 gun owners. I mean, right. that's, that's what, I don't know how many, there's like, what, 6 million people in Massachusetts around. Yeah, it's almost 10%. It's a little yeah. less than 10% of the state is registered. And that's not even counting registered voters. Right. So if we just got that's the- a, That's a really good point. Yeah, if we just got the gun stores, the gun owners, hey, you know, This vote. could be what brings a, some, to some level a red wave in 2026, up the ballot, just like you said. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It starts with this initiative, and then it goes up town, city, county, and then state. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah, we got to get people out to vote. We got to get them uh, to register to vote. And I think uh, Jared Giannis of Guns and Gadgets did a video uh, state by state how many sportsmen aren't registered to vote. And I think Massachusetts was like 10,000 sportsmen that get a hunting license every year and never vote. Yeah. And I think it has a lot to do with. Um, a, a, a lot, there are a lot of uh, we, we interviewed Jim Lyons who's the former RNC chair of, uh, chair of the Massachusetts RNC or, uh, GOP my bad um, and he said that there are 400,000 registered Republicans in Massachusetts and there are twice as many so 800,000 MAGA supporting independents in Massachusetts that's crazy, but these people aren't voting. If they were voting, we'd see it. We'd be a very red state, but they're not voting because they're they're demoralized. They're 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 scared. They just are like, oh, what's the point? Why vote? So this, I mean, just to echo what we just said, like this is a great opportunity to bring those unlikely voters out of the woodwork mm -hmm. and to actually sign a petition. And like they're they're independents, like they're registered, like they can sign this petition. So actually, this is giving them an opportunity to to uh, put their signature where their mouth is so to speak yeah. yeah i hope somebody's writing up like a one page like three like kind of like the three points you just laid out here here's why this bill is a slam dunk unconstitutional you need to sign this petition if you're a you know freedom loving massachusettsian or whatever like right. i don't know if anybody's doing that but we're gonna get the message out we're still working on messaging and really it needs to be uh, and i know i'm tipping my hand here <laughs> by talking about this but we need to get it out in front of it and it needs to be axiomatic. It needs to be obvious right. when you see it that something bad has happened to my rights mm -hmm. and I need to claw them back. For sure. It's up to me to claw them back. And I don't know what that message is. The best I can come up with is you can't do that, you know? Yeah. <laughs> or the you can't do that. 
right. petition or whatever. Right. Uh, also, you know, recall your rights or the Second Amendment is or gun rights are civil rights. You know, these type of things yeah. that will start to get people thinking. But I wish it was even more concise and succinct than that, where it's like you look at it and go, wait, what just happened? Like, no, wait a minute. I didn't volunteer you to take my rights away. Like, you know, the Federalist 49, which uh, was authored by Madison, who's the author of the Constitution, wrote that the legislature is the most important branch of government because they have a confidential... Uh, responsibility as defender right. of our rights. So if they're the defender of our rights, and yet they go and violate our rights, who's left to defend us? Yeah. Nobody, right? They are from the blood of the people. They are the numer- they're numerous. They're the business owners. They're the of the people, by the people, for the people. But if they're in their ivory towers writing two different types of law, one for them and one for us, you know, who do we look to? Now our hope is in the courts to overturn or in the executive body to not enforce, Mm -hmm. which none of that sounds good to me. I would much rather them do the job that they were sent there to do, to be the confidential guardian of our rights and fight for that and make sure there's no encroachment, there's no infringement, there's no uh, hurdles put in place for the... uh, exercise of our rights. Yeah. So the messaging is really important on this bill. And we want the anti-gunners to have to respond to us, not watch them come out with save the children and you want blood <laughs> in the streets and nobody needs, yeah. you know, all the regular rhetoric that they've been spewing for the last 30 years. I want our messaging to be out in front. Offensive. Offensive. Yeah. And also eye-opening and awakening the masses that their rights were just eroded mm. without their consent. And they can't do that. Let's so, do it. I like that you can't do that. Put more <laughs> Healy in the penalty box or right? whatever. I, it's funny because I've mentioned this on several <laughs> co- podcasts. And um, I don't know if we were talking about that off air or before while well, we started the I podcast. I can't remember. I can't remember. <laughs> but uh, the context of that is, if, if I'm repeating myself, you can cut it out. Uh, if you've ever been to a high school or a college hockey game, when the visiting team commits a pel- penalty, the student section always yells at them on the way to the box, you can't do that, you know, and, yeah. and uh, it's a kind of a fun moment in the game, but really it's the eye-opening moment of this, what they did. They can't do that. Right. And neither can the people. We can't vote away our own rights either. So um, the the point I'm trying to make is uh, it, it really – um, resonates with people and they're, they're starting to use it as a hashtag mm-hmm. in my social media posts posts because I've mentioned that on so many different occasions awesome. as, I'm, as I'm watching it. And I'm like, shoot, I wasn't really trying to make that the campaign <laughs> slogan, but maybe it is, you know, yeah. maybe it should be. It's simple, and it's to the know. point, it's clear. Right. Like, yeah. yeah, especially if you're going out and you're giving like a stump speech at like a Republican town committee or in Boston, you can just be like taking away our constitutional rights. And then you say, say it with me, you can't do that to more Healy right at the state. I <laughs> right. mean, like that's, that's the way to get, especially younger people and people who are like, Hey, I'm 19 and I've been hunting since I was eight with my dad. Yeah. And now all of a sudden I can't use this gun that I've always been. And I, I think, I think it's brilliant. So I'm, I'm with it. All right. Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe Sweet. we got to roll that out. Then. Let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> um, one more question. I know we're kind of going a while here, but are you, are you optimistic like, how are you feeling about this? Like, you kind of have a, a, a you kind of have a, a finger on the pulse of two A in Massachusetts. Where are we at? Are we going? Do you think it's going to go in the right direction, or not? And then also, you can just kind of plug any you know rapid fire radio or sure. plug Cape Gunworks. And I am extremely optimistic, and the reason is I predicted as soon as the Bruin decision happened, um, I said it's going to get worse before it gets better, because. The people in control that hate our rights, that are anti-civil rights, that are anti-constitution, are going to throw a temper tantrum. They're going to bemoan and react, and they're going to pass bad law that's going to be tough to deal with for a while. But once 
they do, we're going to challenge it. We're going to win one way or another. This is all going to get fixed someday. When? I don't know. Um, Maybe in the court of heaven. <laughs> yeah. A lot of people are saying, like, just move. Just leave the state. Like, you have a great business. Just uproot it. The the doors have been flung open in New Hampshire to us. Like, mm -hmm. please come. We will support your business. And the truth of the matter is, I believe, if we just flee, you know, then who's going to do it, right? Who's going to fight yeah. the battle? We're just writing off this state. Yeah. And if the eight or nine states that have these type of laws fall, that's a th over a third of the country. That's a third. You know, that's the one thing people don't realize is this is in the most uh, populous states in the country, California, Massachusetts, New York, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. You know, these states are the ones with these issues. And the Second Amendment needs to be defended wherever it's attacked. And if we don't defend it in Massachusetts, if we just write this state off to the, to the anti-gunners, well, they're not going to be happy with that. They want total disarmament throughout the country. So... This thing spreads like a plague mm. upon the country. So if we don't stop it where the fight is, we just run and go to the free state so that we can enjoy a little bit of comfort and a little bit of uh, freedom along the way. All we're doing is just making it so that our kids and our grandkids are going to have to deal with this decades yeah. down the road. And I would rather stop it in its tracks where the fight is, when the fight is. I believe that's the true patriot spirit. Spirit, When King George III sent his redcoats to Lexington and Concord to take the arms from the patriots, they didn't say, shoot, we got to go to New Hampshire, right? <laughs> Get the guns, put them on the wagon, let's go up to New Hampshire. Just flee, yeah. Yeah, they didn't just go to a freer place, yeah. more res you know urban yeah, I mean, have massachusetts let's right. let's go to new hampshire you know <laughs> right they didn't just run yeah. they they stood draw drew a line in the sand the shot heard around the world was fired and the greatest nation that ever existed on earth was formed yeah and i believe that same patriotic spirit needs to happen in massachusetts for such a time as this because if not us who's going to do it mm -hmm. and if it isn't now when is it yeah. I don't want to fire the shot heard around the world. Amen. I want to stop it in a peaceful way. Yeah. We don't need the Civil War 2.0, which there's a lot of people that are like, is it time? And it's like, no, it's not time. It's time for unity. It's time to tell people who aren't maybe right-wing MAGA people but still believe in the Second Amendment, like, hey, come on over. There's a place for you at the table. Yeah. And, you know, there's a place for the person who isn't political that just doesn't go through life with politics but do doesn't want their rights infringed to say, hey, you know what, come on over here. Let's have a talk. Let's talk about what just happened to your rights because, frankly, there is an attack on our all of our rights. Mm -hmm. And if we get used to just turning tail and running, then this country is doomed. Yep. And it, we might as well just write it off now, you know. So um, I don't believe we're at that period in history where, um, you know, hostile takeover by the communists is going to happen. I think we can fight it. I think this could be made right. And I believe that mm -hmm. with everything in me. Mm -hmm. And I believe that the courts are trending in the right direction. I believe the, the people of Massachusetts are as energized as they have ever been. Oh, yeah. And right now they are mad that their rights have been infringed and they are looking for something that they can do and they're willing to vote and sign petitions and donate yeah. money and hold a sign and put a sign in front of their house. And that I think is the future and that's what we need to, we need to energize. And so, um, that I think is really, really, really important going over the next two years. Yeah, channeling the Amen. fighter, the the warrior spirit, mm -hmm. the, the spirit of seventeen seventy six, and right. re reviving it. I mean, that's that's the whole point of this podcast is we're bringing Christ filled right. conservatism to Massachusetts and New England from a Gen Z perspective. That's like, that's this podcast in a nutshell. Love it. And this is this is how we do it. This is For this sure. is step one. I mean, we just interviewed uh, Mike King, who's the CEO of Massachusetts Family Institute, a, a family policy council mm -hmm. in the state. And I mean, he's doing that from a school board perspective and he's fighting, you know, the pornographic sexual, sexual education that's going on in school. So like, this is all the same fight. It's just from a different side of the coin. Right. And this is all like, so I just want to thank you for, for coming on the podcast. Sure. 
Um, and actually, there's one more thing I have to say. When you brought up when you brought up the whole idea of people leaving mm-hmm. the state just because like oh, I'll just go to New Hampshire, whatever. Hunter and I talk about that all of the time. Uh, you could it's it's almost like hot tub syndrome. This is what you think about it like it's hot tub syndrome. It's like oh, the, you got the per, you got the the person who lives in Massachusetts with a home in Florida, and they're and the, he and his rich buddies are just sitting in a hot tub in Florida just complaining about. Massachusetts are complaining about it and but they're not doing anything they have money they have a second home but they're they they're not willing to actually put their money where their mouth is yeah. and they're not willing to live in the state uh, and actually fight for it right. that's that is something that irks me and Hunter to no end <laughs> so I appreciate I really appreciate that sure. yeah. it could we be would be a lot easier and more profitable to just just to go to a freer state but right. it needs to happen it is here. it is something that you got to be uniquely, um, you got to feel a calling or a passion for it because, frankly, who wants to make life harder when you don't need to, yeah. right? And, um, and that's really what it comes down to. I understand the sentiment of wanting to just raise my family and be left alone and not have government reaching into every pocket in my jeans, mm-hmm. you know, the whole time. Uh, so... There's, but there's what lots kind of, of message is that is that sending right. to your kids? It's like, oh yeah, when things get hard, I give up and I take the easy route. Right. That's not what we teach our. That's not plus, what we should be teaching our kids at all. Plus, like we're from Massachusetts, we're all about. We came back twenty eight to three in the Super Bowl. Like that is the spirit of like <laughs> not to not to make a deep conversation like compared to football, but seriously, like well, hey, that that's, works. That's what we're all about. Is like you know we started the revolution here. Right. We were like, I mean, we were. Tom we're, Brady continued it, and we will also. <laughs> exactly. So, I mean, in the spirit of Tom Brady, you know. <laughs> but didn't he cut and run and go to Florida? He did. True. Oh no. He did, but we can redeem that. We we'll, can redeem it we'll, on a That's much. That's actually a fu- very funny. <laughs> 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 he <laughs> did. He did go to Tampa, and you know. So uh, <laughs> stay and fight where the fight is, and For I would sure. say that to anyone. But I will agree, yeah. there is a net loss of a thousand people per week sh- fleeing the state. Yeah. And they're not the people that are on the system and collecting the handout and getting free housing and getting free food and all that. It is the working class mm-hmm. people that are um, producing jobs and producing uh, income and, and raising a family and are frustrated with the, the way it is and how hard and difficult it is. So, yeah, uh, yeah I, I understand the sentiment, <laughs> but here I am. So yeah. let's do it. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you, Toby. You want to plug any of your stuff real quick? Sure. If you want to follow us, our work, um, you can go to at Cape Gunworks or at Rapid Fire Radio. We do a weekly podcast on Wednesday from 4 to 6 p.m. I'm also a frequent contributor to the Grace Curley Show on Tuesdays from 2.20 to 2.45, where we do a lot of calls on WRKO. You can go to thegracecurleyshow.com and listen live. Call in. It's a live call in radio show uh, for 2A Tuesday. And then I do a, my own radio show on Sundays from noon to one on WXTK. That's also a live call in show, um, rapid fire on WXTK. So, um, yeah, that's how you can find us and stay up to date with what we got going on. Sweet. Awesome. And to all the gun owners, the patriots in Massachusetts who might be new to this channel or, or whatever. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and all that. Do that. And also, don't forget, sign the petition when it comes out mm-hmm. and tell Maura Healy, you can't do that. You can't take away our rights. Love it. Thank you, Toby. My pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. I can reach you. <laughs>